Good afternoon. My name is Heath Rowe, and I'm a volunteer with the Santa Monica Authors at Google team. If you'd like to get involved or have people and authors you'd like to recommend, please don't be shy. We're always open to ideas. Today we're here to learn a little bit about something that's just spitting distance away from the office, the Santa Monica Pier. And today we've got someone who probably knows more about the Pier than uh, at least anyone that I've met. Uh, his name's James Harris, or Jim Harris, and he's the Pier Historian for the Santa Monica Pier Restoration Corporation. He's been a fixture on the pier since 1989, and his first job on the pier was tending bar at a little dive called the Boathouse Restaurant, uh, which is where Bubba Gump is today. And so the pier has, has a long, long history of various locations. Uh, he's the historian for the pier, but he's also a writer, a playwright, and his writing credits include the stage plays and Illegal Start, and that little ding. He also does a couple of online newsletters for various area experiences, such as uh, the newsletter for the website, venicebeach.com. And he does the newsletter for the pier called Beyond the Pier Sign. Jim Harris. Thank you, Heath. And, and thank you to all of you that are attending today and all of Google. I, uh, when I toured the offices here in Santa Monica a couple of months ago, I ran back to my office at the pier and I said, I found the best place in Santa Monica to work. And they laughed at me as if they were looking out the window because we do have enviable offices ourselves. But <laughs> Anyway, um, the Santa Monica Pier just celebrated its 100th birthday. And uh, when we learned that nobody was writing a book to commemorate the pier's 100th birthday, our office took on the task of doing so. And uh, I was assigned the task because I'd had some writing experience and because I've been on the pier for 20 years. The, uh, the pier today hosts 4 million visitors, and 4, 4 million annual visitors, and that's far more than it ever has in its history. It actually began as something much more modest and has grown. Sometimes it has had its ups and downs like anything else, but today we are at the, the peak of the pier's popularity. And it's really been a pleasure to be a part of the centennial celebration and to be able to share the history with people in, in this book, um, Santa Monica Pier, A Century on the Last Great Pleasure Pier. Like I said, and, and like Heath said, I began as a bartender at the boathouse. And uh, when you're a bartender, you learn early on that uh, the best skill that you have to make yourself money is your listening skills. And so I became a very good listener, and I found an extra benefit. benefit. I got to learn about the history and the character of the pier. And the more I heard, the more interested I became. And uh, so I would, I would gather these stories in my head so that someday I could tell them, tell other people, tell other customers, since I was a bartender, about what the pier was like. Um, when, this, right, when this book project came up, I was probably the most excited person in the office to get, to get the actual book out until I began the research. And the reason I say that is the research that I wanted to do was from the beginning to the end, finding everything out that I could in old newspapers and such. And that included the Santa Monica paper, The Evening Outlook. The Evening Outlook in the library is not indexed. So I had to read through every single headline and catch every single little bit using what knowledge that I did have and a lot of hope to try and get as much information as I could. And that's what went into this book. Also what went into this book was interviews with people, local people, people who had uh, had some sort of a relationship with the pier. And some of those really gave the book a lot of personality. You'll notice it's not just a history book, it's not just a picture book, but there's a lot of color in the, in the stories and the people that I, I share in the book. Um, among those, and I've, I've gathered quotes from people about what they felt about the pier, and one among those was uh, the late mayor, late Santa Monica mayor, Herb Katz who unfortunately never got to see the book in its published form, but was generous enough to give me this quote, which is right at the front of the book, and it's, the pier is sacred. It is part of Santa Monica. It is part of our life. Without it, Santa Monica would not be Santa Monica. And if you think about it for a minute, when you, when you hear of Santa Monica, just about everyone pictures the Ferris wheel or the pier sign. Certainly something to do with the pier. Otherwise, it's just a, another beach community that, that would mix in with others. Now, the pier, as I said, 4 million, 4 million visitors annually now. The 
Pier was not built to be the great tourist attraction that it's become. Rather, it was built as a public utility. In 1909, and actually in 1907, the city of Santa Monica was dealing with a lot of growth and a lot of waste. And by waste, I mean sewage, the accumulation of sewage. So the city leaders brainstormed for ideas of what were they going to do with their sewage and ultimately came up with the plan to run a 1,600-foot pipe out over the ocean underneath a pier and drop treated sewage into the ocean. And the reason it ran out 1,600 feet was so that they would not have the sewage washed back onto their already popular beaches. So it would wash out to sea. Not exactly a glamorous beginning. However, it was, no, uh, it was, no, it was notable that uh, the pier was the first ever concrete pier to be built on, built on the west coast of the United States. Other piers had been made of wood and had uh, not lasted long against the elements and against the uh, natural, the teredo worms, which were eating up the pilings, pilings on the piers. So the city of Santa Monica decided to build a concrete pier. The technology was pretty new, and the concrete piles that were built to last forever lasted about 10 years before giving way. And ultimately, the pier became, they, they replaced the concrete pilings with wooden pilings and the concrete deck with a wooden deck. And you have the pier that, like you see today with the wooden deck that you can walk upon. Today it's a mixture of concrete and wooden pilings. But it didn't, the, uh, the most popular thing about the pier, of course, was not its sewage and not the ability to walk over the ocean, but the fishermen immediately became attracted to the pier. In fact, a week before the pier opened, a fisherman named John McCreary snuck out to the end of the pier and caught a yellowtail and declared the Santa Monica Municipal Pier as the best fishing spot in all of Santa Monica Bay. Quickly, of course, fishermen were lining up and down the pier. There was the man who sweared he would fish on the pier till the day he died. He did. And uh, back in those days, the fish were much more abundant and much larger. What you see in this picture is a giant black sea bass. These were common. They were caught off barges and off of the pier. Now, if you can imagine, this fish could weigh as much as 500 pounds, be eight feet long. If you can imagine trying to, haul, to hoist that up onto a pier, it was quite a task. These fish could, last to be, could live to be 60 years old. They were fished out so quickly that it, it became, uh, they couldn't replace themselves, and they'd become an endangered species. We've begun seeing some more black sea bass around the pier, and it's very exciting when, whenever a diver sees one more. They have hooked one off of the pier, catch, and they've caught it and released it. It's just very exciting to have them back among our, our pier com community. Now, it didn't take long for people to think that they could do more with the pier than just walk on it and fish on it. Charles Liu, who was a very famous carousel carver in the early 1900s, wanted to build an amusement pier somewhere in the area, and he chose next to the Santa Monica Municipal Pier as his ideal destination. Now, Charles, he was famous, like I said, a famous carousel carver. He carved the very first carousel horses for Coney Island. And then he began expanding his enterprise all over the United States. He had a, a shop in Long Beach, and he still chose Santa Monica over Long Beach. And the reason that he chose the Santa Monica Pier was three things. He chose it for the people. He liked the community. He chose it for the, the beaches, the beautiful beaches that Santa Monica had. But most of all, he chose it for the accessibility. Already, there was an electric tram that ran up and down Santa Monica Beach. And some of you may have seen pictures of this, this tram. Apparently, as a side note, apparently nobody paid for this tram. I keep hearing stories of, I used to ride that tram, but I used to hide on the back. Nobody paid the nickel or so. <laughs> anyway, there was a tram that ran up and down the beach. Also, um, the Santa Monica Municipal Pier was a, an ending point for the, the red car trains that used to, to travel all over Los Angeles. So immediately you had a place that a lot of people were going to be dropped off. Also, with the new boulevard systems that were being developed, Santa Monica was going to become a very popular place, particularly near the pier, for the automobile to, uh, to drive. So the people, the beaches, but mostly for the transportation. He wanted everybody who came to, to Santa Monica to come right to his access point first. This is what the Santa Monica Pier looked like when uh, this is what Charles Luke's version of the Santa Monica Pier looked like. This is a photo from 1917. Some of you may recognize the building in the foreground as the, the building that houses the carousel. It was called the Luke Hippodrome, and it was built in 1916. 
It included uh, one of Luke's carousels, of course, his own hand-carved car carousel. And above it were apartments. And he and his son Arthur lived in the apartments while they were building this, this Santa Monica loop pier. Also in this picture are the pier's first roller coasters, the wooden Blue Streak Racer, and the, uh, the Periscope, which is a big, a giant swing, which I don't think would probably be legal in any amusement park today. If you've ever seen pictures close up of it, it would be a very frightening ride, but uh, a lot of fun. Unfortunately, in 1918, Charles Luth passed away, and Arthur, his son, tried to continue running operations but he was also involved in the Santa Cruz Pier, or the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk, rather. And the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk still has his roller coaster, that old wooden roller coaster at Santa Cruz. That's Arthur Luth, the son of Charles Luth, the man who, who created the Luth Pier in Santa Monica. In 1923, Arthur Luth sold the amusement pier operation to a Santa Monica amusement company, a, a group of uh, Santa Monica businessmen who, uh, wanted to build up the Santa Monica Pier as people's playground. They, the first thing they did was replace the roller coaster. The roller coaster that the Luths had put on was not the fastest, not the scariest, really not a, a featured type roller coaster, especially when you compared to other amusement piers in the Santa Monica Bay. And at the time, there were five other amusement piers in the Santa Monica Bay, two of which had many roller coasters. So they, they built a roller coaster to compete with those other piers, but the the diamond in their crown was the La Monica Ballroom. This was the largest ballroom in the world. It had a dance floor that could hold 5,000 people at one time. On the opening day of, of the La Monica Ballroom, there were over 50,000 people that showed up. This caused the first ever traffic jam in Santa Monica. If you can imagine 50,000 people coming to the Santa Monica Pier at once um, just to go to a ballroom. That's quite a spectacle of people waiting outside a building that can only fit 10,000 people in. The La Monica Ballroom was unfortunately a victim of the financial difficulties that came just a few years later and never really saw the, the success that, uh, that they had dreamed of it as a ballroom. But it did eventually become things like a roller rink, um, the city's convention center. It was briefly used as the city jail. There were apartments in it. There was an aquarium in it, the lifeguard headquarters. They found many uses for this ballroom up until in 1962, the walls were beginning to buckle and the roof was caving in and they had to tear it down. And it's really a tragic loss that we, really, that we only have this ballroom in, in photos anymore. They say it looked like a palace floating over the ocean. It was, it was where Pacific, excuse me, Pacific Park is now where the Ferris wheel and the roller coaster are, it's right in that area. Yes, the Spade Cooley show. Um, Spade Cooley was a swing western musician who was uh, very popular at the time. And he, uh, he had a, sh a weekly show in the Santa Monica Ballroom, the, the La Monica Ballroom, later called the Santa Monica Ballroom. And in 1947, KTLA broadcast from broadcast his show from the La Monica Ballroom for the first ever live broadcast of a variety TV show, and then it became a weekly weekly broadcast. Ultimately, Spade Cooley moved into a studio for KTLA to continue shooting. They did begin at the Santa Monica Pier. Now, also when they first built the Municipal Pier in 1909, many people were talking about creating a, a yacht harbor. Uh, it was, Santa Monica seemed like the ideal town to have a yacht harbor. It just, uh, it was something that the community was, was well behind for many years. Unfortunately, it just never quite happened for the first couple of decades. A lot of bu bureaucracy, even William Randolph Hearst got involved for a while to keep the, the uh, harbor from being built because he was going to build his own nearby. Ultimately, in 1933, the city of Santa Monica passed an initiative where they could fund a breakwater and they did decide to build it. They were going to build it out of concrete cribs, which uh, I guess is a little bit questionable. When you've already failed with concrete once, why would you try again? And uh, they did learn the same lesson again. They, they placed the first concrete crib out off of the end of the pier, and it cracked. 
And all this money that the people had put into it all of a sudden seemed as if it was going to go to waste. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers stepped in and said, scrap the idea of the concrete cribs and just build a rock mound. So they did. They built the breakwater out of rock, a big rock mound like what you see at, at Long Beach or Marina del Rey today. And uh, Santa Monica had its own breakwater and its own official yacht harbor. It opened in 1934, just in time for the first uh, annual Santa Monica Yacht Regatta. It, there, there was actually a little bit of uh, stress about whether or not they were going to be able to open in time, and they did in August of 1934. The breakwater, unfortunately, was not still not very well built. The top rock was too heavy, and it kept falling off. Sand would accumulate. Um, uh, behind the breakwater to the point where they had to keep dredging it. So the, the, the breakwater and the yacht harbor became a, a very big financial burden on the city. And by the late 1970s, it was sparsely populated. And in 1983, um, storms did away with the breakwater altogether. Now, I mentioned the accumulation of sand because originally the beach of Santa Monica was not the broad beach that it's famous for now. Uh, the beach actually began, the, the water line came all the way to the carousel building, which if you've been to the Santa Monica Pier, you know it's pretty, pretty close to, uh, to the city of Santa Monica and the cliffs. The breakwater caused all of that sand to build up, and it created the, the broad sandy beaches that uh, Santa Monica is famous for today. And the pier sign. What I love about this sign, and I have to go back to a time when I was speaking of about a year ago in front of a, a group of people. And a young man who had just moved here from Africa said that his uh, friends told him that he had to go to the Santa Monica Pier. So he went driving by in front of this sign several times looking for a sign that said Santa Monica Pier. Now, we all know this is the Santa Monica Pier sign, but nowhere on it does it say the Santa Monica Pier. It actually says Santa Monica Yacht Harbor. And that, of course, is because of the Yacht Harbor that existed at the time. This sign was put up in 1941. And the reason that they put this, this large arched sign at the top of the cliff was because of the highway interchange that goes underneath where this sign is. Now, driving under this sign today, you're driving over a bridge, and underneath is a very complex little system of roads and highways. When they built that system of roads and highways and built this bridge, you could no longer see the pier from above the cliff. So people were confused as to where they would actually turn to go down to the pier. So the Santa Monica Pier Businessmen's Association gathered, pooled up their money, and they had this sign erected in 1941. And it's turned out to be the, one of the greatest icons of Santa Monica. The people in the photo are a mixture of, uh, of um, peer businessmen and city commissioners and two actresses, Mary O'Driscoll and Susan Hayward. And um, the man in the fedora, it's an interesting story about this photo. The man in the fedora with the striped tie That man that I just pointed to, his name is, is uh, Dick Hernage. He was the president of the, the Santa Monica Pier Businessmen's Association at the time. He ran boating operations out off of the end of the pier ever since the 1920s. Very much a fixture on the pier. He, uh, he passed away in 1951. And I never thought I'd be able to come across any of his relatives. But I did happen to, to meet, just by chance, his son. Um, through a series of phone calls. And his son sent me this photo. And the reason I mention it is this photo is a first generation of, of the photo of the pier sign. For years, we've been looking, our office has been looking at, pier, at photos of this particular sign that were faded. They didn't have near the detail that this one does. So you'll see the tear in the corner. And you saw a tear in an earlier picture also supplied by, by uh, Jim Hernage. Um, I will take that tear in the corner and keep the clarity of the photo any day. It's just, it's one of our favorite photos that we have in the office right now for the fact that it is an actual first generation. And nobody else can say it. In, uh, in 1943, the, uh, the amusement part of the pier that had had the roller coasters was uh, not so much an amusement park anymore. In fact, by 1930, the roller coaster and all the thrill rides were gone, and the only real ride left on the pier was the carousel. In 1943, Walter Newcomb, who uh, was a banker from Venice, stepped in and 
and uh, purchased the franchise to the amusement pier. He had hoped to uh, to rebuild it as the, the thrill, thrill ride filled amusement park that had been there before. But um, he never did quite achieve his goal. What he did, though, was um, bring his own carousel from the Venice Pier. He owned a carousel on the Venice Pier. The carousel on the Santa Monica Pier, the loop carousel had been gone for a few years. And the, this carousel was a much nicer carousel than what had replaced it. So he brought this 1922 Philadelphia Toboggan Company carousel from the Venice Pier and put it on to, to the Santa Monica Pier. It is the same carousel that's on the pier now. It was built in 19, it was built in 1922. It was the Philadelphia Toboggan Company, PTC number 62, all original hand-carved horses, and it is uh, really one of the treasures of Santa Monica today. I think uh, it's hard for me to, uh, whenever I whenever I meet somebody on the pier, it's hard for me to meet someone who hasn't ridden it at some point in their life they've been to the pier before, and if it's their first time to the pier, it's just a very popular attraction. And it's popular for all ages. I mean, children love it, and then parents take their children, and then the grandparents take their, take their grandchildren. It's just something that, that provides endless joy, and all it really does is go around in a circle, which is also endless joy if you really think about it. Um, Walter passed away in 1954 and left the amusement pier to his wife, Enid Lupin. Um, at the time, it was unusual for a woman to be operating something as large as, as an amusement pier. Um, but but she did it. She actually she uh, owned and operated it until 1974. She did bring in family friends, the Gordon family, and I mentioned their involvement because their family is still on the pier today. They've been on the pier since 1955. They own the Playland Arcade. Um, but throughout their their history, they owned. Um, for a long time, owned and operated the carousel. Um, they had arcades, of course. They had archery. They uh, they had a gift shop. In fact, they still have a gift shop on the pier. So Playland Arcade and Marlene Peach Comer gift shop, over 50 years on the pier. And I think that's pretty pretty astounding these days to find a family that's been involved in a business like that for, for so long. The uh, the late 50s and, and throughout the 60s and even into the early 70s were not so kind to the Santa Monica Pier. It was uh, a financial drain, like I said, having to rebuild the breakwater and having to, to dredge the, the sand from the harbor and just general upkeep. And uh, it got to be too much for the city to where they couldn't keep up. And it began to uh, fall into a serious state of disrepair. A lot of people consider these the best days of the pier. And the reason is because the community that developed during that time made it to where the pier was like an actual neighborhood floating over the water. Um, apartments in the carousel, those were not the only apartments. Other buildings that had been on the pier began to lease out for apartments, and be it became the home for a lot of artists and, and activists. Now, anyone who knows Santa Monica knows its uh, history of activism. Um, one of my one of my dearest friends that I've made in all of this, her name is Colleen Friedman, and she used to host parties in the carousel to support the plight of Daniel Ellsberg and Cesar Chavez. She was very good friends with Joan Baez, who we'll hear a little bit more about in a minute. But um, the, the pier was, was uh, filled with those kind of people, and it was just a really interesting community to hang around. A lot of people considered it seedy, seedy, artistic. I think they kind of go hand in hand sometimes in a very positive way. But throughat the '60s, the state and the city of Santa Monica, the state of California and the city of Santa Monica were trying to figure out what, what they could do to make traffic towards Malibu easier and more, more uh, to make it better. And they were considering making a causeway, which was basically a, a bridge over a series of small islands that would take you over the water to Malibu. And when this idea finally failed after several attempts that it came up, the city of Santa Monica, the city manager of Santa Monica, was given the task of figuring out what to do with the pier. All of this thought of, of building the causeway, nobody thought to really to fix up the pier in, the, in that amount of time because they didn't know if they would keep the pier. So, you're, are you going to build a causeway or are you going to keep the pier? Um, they, so much attention was put into the causeway, the pier was getting worse and worse. So, city manager Perry Scott was given the task 
of trying to figure out what to do with the pier now that the causeway was dead. He came back with the idea of building a man-made island out of the, rem the remnants of the breakwater. The pier wasn't in his plans. His idea was to get rid of the pier. Now, in 1973, or in 1974, the, the franchise for the, the Newcomb Pier, for Enid Newcomb's pier, was going to expire anyway, and she was, her orders were to tear down her part of the pier at the end of that, that lease. The municipal pier, of course, I just said, was in a serious state of disrepair, still owned by the city. Harry Scott thought to, uh, to replace both, since the new pier was going to be torn down anyway, to replace both with a bridge to this man-made island. The man-made island would have a resort hotel and a convention center and all sorts of shopping and, and fun amenities for people. It was a very commercial affair. The people of the city of Santa Monica didn't agree. And so there was a great outpour of, of rebellion, actually, against, <laughs> against the city. The city council voted to pass, voted to accept the, the city manager's proposal. And each city council member who, uh, who had voted to tear down the pier ended up facing an assault from the city of Santa Monica and, and other um, people who loved the pier. And uh, ultimately, each of the city council members who voted to tear down the pier were voted out of office. Now, movements, there were two movements on the pier. There was the Save the, Save the Pier campaign and the Santa Monica Citizens Committee Save the Pier campaign. Both met on the pier. Both were uh, very heavily involved with trying to influence media and petitioning and trying to influence, influence the local politicians. During one city council meeting, um, Larry Barber, the uh, chairman of the Save the Santa Monica Pier Committee, gave a, a beautiful, beautiful speech. And part of it he said, and I think that this is really a striking statement, it's like a family. You don't get rid of your grandmother because she's a little old. Now, in this speech, um, he presented a plan by a man named Jack Sicking, who everybody credits with the save the, being behind the Save the Pier movement and really making it all come together and happen. And this plan presented a very positive idea of what the pier could become if, they, if the city would just draw, draw their attention more towards it. It included an amusement park. It included uh, restoration of the carousel, which, uh, like the rest of the pier, was, was seen, had seen better times. It included um, bringing all sorts of other fun elements to the pier, which would make it more attractive, including um, museums to, to, attract, uh, to focus on its history. All of these things that were in his plan, in some form or another, has since come to be. Um, in 1973, the city council did go ahead and change their minds. And like I said, each city councilman, even though they voted to keep the pier standing, was ultimately voted out of office. But they saved the pier, and in 1975, the pier was declared a landmark, it was given landmark status, and declared that the only way that anything could happen to tear down or alter the pier in a major way was through a vote of the people, not by the city council. Then in 1983, Mother Nature did, effectively did what uh, the city council had tried to do. And on January 27, 1983, a storm was reported heading toward, headed towards the pier with 10-foot seas. The lower fishing deck at the west end of the pier was eight feet above the water. So everybody knew something had to give. And a lot of people, a lot of locals, braved the weather that day, braved um, rain and sleet, to uh, stand on the Palisades and watch as these high seas rolled in. And sure enough, they rolled in and they destroyed the, the lower fishing deck at the west end of the pier. The city manager at the time, um, after this storm and after, after surveying the damage, said, without even hesitation, we will rebuild. And they began rebuilding out at the west end. But the, the first thing they had to do was remove some debris. They took a large crane out to the end of the pier and began cleaning up the, the remnants of the west end. Another storm came on March 1st, an even bigger storm. And this storm ended up knocking that crane into the water, which served as a battering ram. And it wiped out the pier, a, a total of one third of the surface of the pier, including the entire west end. And you can see almost all the way to the beach. Again, the city manager said, we will rebuild, but they didn't make any immediate plans. Um, it would be a much greater task. And uh, so they went through a lot of 
the city planning as to exactly how to do this and where the funding was going to come from. And while they were at it, they were trying to figure out how to make the pier more viable. And they used Jack Sicking's plans to make the pier more attractive and more viable. In 1989, and this is when I came to the pier, this is what the pier looked like. There was a long metal pier alongside the what would become ultimately the rest of the pier. And uh, they ran cranes alongside and they were rebuilding it. It was a three-year process from 1987 to 1990 to rebuild the entire pier as it was. And that's without any buildings on the end. In April of 1990, they, uh, they opened, reopened the West End for the first time. And it was a very exciting day. I was there. It was amazing. There was a lot of really positive energy. And it was just for a great big flat pier. Now, that's not the pier that we know today. Since then, the pier has uh, reached the, really the full potential that everyone had hoped and imagined and uh, is known actually primarily for two things today. And both of those are in this picture. And has anyone been to the pier that can tell me what the two things are in this picture that really identify Santa Monica Pier today? The Ferris wheel, the amusement park, Pacific Park for one, bringing back the amusement parks to the pier. And all of these people are sitting on the pier deck waiting for one of the famous Thursday night concerts. And the Thursday night Twilight Dance Series concerts um, have been going on. This will be their 26th year. Last year, we were so lucky to have uh, Joan Baez, who's been a long time friend of here. Um, and I, I mention her because she and Robert Redford were uh, the honorary co-chairs of our centennial committee for our centennial celebration last year. Each has had a very, very uh, active role in the peers' history. And, and Robert Redford, actually, his first memory was of being four years old when he came to ride the carousel. And uh, he learned that, uh, or he, he knows that he was four years old because another kid had uh, approached him and asked him how old he was. And, and he said, I, I'm four. And the guy says, well, I'm five. I'm older than you. And this is, uh, this is Robert Redford's first memory. Now, everybody knows Robert Redford was in the sting, too. Sorry, the sting also, and uh, he has had a long, <laughs> long history of uh, of just being on or near the pier, and and of course one of his most famous films on on the pier in the carousel building. Joan Baez, I mentioned Colleen Creeden earlier, the the activist that lived above the carousel. Joan was a regular visitor. She was around for the 1973 Save the Pier movement, and uh, was very involved with the with the people saving the pier at the time. But really what she liked to do is just kick back in Joan's apartment, and, or in Colleen's apartment, and relax. And this is a photograph of her kicking back and relaxing in that apartment. A lot of people thought that she lived up in that apartment. And um, one of my first tasks when I, I thought that I would write this book was to track down that rumor and see if it was true. And I contacted Joan Baez's manager. She said, no, she never really lived there. She just spent a lot of time there. But I can put you in touch with her friend, Colleen Creeden. And that's how my friendship with Colleen was started. And it, it's just been a very beautiful thing for, for all of us. I think, uh, I know Scott enjoys meeting her. Everybody who's, who's been at the pier and has met her really has gotten a kick out of, out of Colleen. And uh, we've seen a lot more of Joan lately, too, which has been great. Now, there have been a lot of celebrities on the pier. And there have been a lot of, uh, like I said, other colorful characters on the pier. And there's one that I just can't go without mentioning. And his name is Captain Olaf C. Olsen. He was a retired sailor who came to Santa Monica um, and for his retirement and basically for his health. But he couldn't stop working. He immediately bought a barge and then operated it for a while, sold it to a movie company, bought another barge, bought some more fishing boats, and it's not exactly the life of a retired man that he left, <laughs> that he led. Um, nor was the fact that he was so active to uh, preserve the Santa Monica Bay's fishing conditions. He fought hard to keep commercial net fishing out of the bay. Santa Monica activism, I think he fit in pretty well. He was a local hero during the Great Depression um, in that he would take someone from the Unemployed Gentlemen's League on one of his boats for free every day to catch their, their haul of fish. He would donate 10% of his catch to needy families. He just seemed like a really great man. I enjoyed, as I was going through all those old newspapers over and over again and, and finding all these, these headlines and these little tidbit stories, he just seemed like a really, really great man who I would love to have met. 
And it turns out that in a way I did, because I was a big fan of the cartoon Popeye. And he was the physical model for Popeye. Um, E.C. Seagar, the man who created Popeye, was a regular visitor to the Santa Monica Pier. He lived here in Santa Monica. He would go down to the pier every day, rent a skiff with his assistant. They would go out in the water, in the harbor, and discuss story ideas. Well, the man that they rented the boat from was Olaf Olsen. And immediately, uh, Olaf Olsen had a very distinct look. E.C. Seagar saw that and applied it to his character Popeye. There are all sorts of really interesting and, and intricate and fun stories that, uh, that I've learned through this process. It's been tremendously rewarding. Um, I, uh, sometimes I just don't even know when to stop talking about what I, what I know. And uh, if you'd like to hear anything else, I'm, I'm happy to share any time. I love taking people on tours of the pier. So anytime you come, try to let me know that beforehand that you're coming, and, and I'll give each of you my card. And I'll, I'm happy to give tours. I'm happy to, to just talk. And another thing I love is to hear stories. I record stories. It's part of my job. Um, if you've had a long relationship with the peer, if you've had interesting stories, I want to hear them and I want to get them recorded so that they don't get lost. It's been really, like I said, the most rewarding part of my job is working on this project, and to me it's never ending. I do. I do. It's a Civil War canon. They were gifted to the city. There are two of them. They were gifted to the city in the early 1900s, um, never, of course, used. They were not usable when they were, when they were given to the city. They used to have uh, actual cannonballs stacked up beside them. Those have, those have long been gone. But uh, they are not – I had always wondered that myself. I, from the first time I went to the pier, I thought, well, is that something left from, from World War II when they were worried about the invasion of Los Angeles? Nothing like that. They're, all, they're just a decorative gift from which the city received. There are things that need to be done. Um, a lot of people, including myself, would like to see the parking lot go somewhere else and be better utilized. Um, we would like to see Pacific Park expand. Um, I would like to get a, mu a real museum, um, not just, uh, you know, we've considered small spaces for museums. We have some historical photo displays. I have a lot of things that I can already put into a museum right now. I would like to see space created for that. Um, there's been talk about moving the Gila Bay Aquarium, which is underneath the pier, up onto the deck. Um, lots of really good ideas, but it all hinges on finding parking close to the pier, but not on the pier deck. And another thing would be uh, the return of the boating community. The, when I first started on the pier in 1989, the, there was talk of rebuilding the breakwater and recreating the, the yacht harbor. And the city, or the, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had put up half of the money to, to do that. Well, that money's long since gone. The city never matched their half, and they never rebuilt the breakwater. And there are a lot of environmentalists who think that it probably shouldn't be, built, be rebuilt anyway as a yacht harbor. But um, what we are trying to do right now is put a, uh, a gangway on the end of the pier. Number one, for emergency escape if, if the need ever arose. And number two, to be used commercially to, to get fishing boats back into the bay somehow, or maybe even just a tour boat around the bay. We're always working on something. Those are the remnants of the breakwater, those jagged rocks. And actually, they create the, the way that, that uh, the way that they are now creates more of a hazard than if it was a makes the water inside more hazardous than it does actually break the water. The current that's right behind those rocks now is extremely dangerous. That's why that you'll see Harbor Patrol won't let any boaters or, or swimmers out in that area. Uh-huh. Oh, great. Yes, uh, that's all I hear about is the lobsters, and some are as big as people. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. 
Yes. That's a very good question. Um, the other piers that, that you mentioned, the, the Venice Pier, the Ocean Park Pier, um, and the Horseshoe Pier, and these other, there were the smaller ones, the Horseshoe Pier and the Prusco Pier, they were all privately owned. And one by one, they either fell to bankruptcy or weather or fire. And the Santa Monica Pier, the municipal pier, the long part that goes out over the ocean, the original concrete that was originally made of concrete has always been owned by the city. And, um, and it never, uh, until 1983, it never suffered the, the storm damage that, uh, that you know, would necessitate tearing the rest of it down. So part of it's by luck, and then the other part is by the people standing up for it. In 1973, it was the only one left. And the people, the fishermen and, and the other people who had come to the piers all the time, noticed that one by one, each of their piers, each of their fishing spots, each, each of their walking over the water spots was disappearing. This was the last one. And that's why it was so important to the people to, to save this last one in favor of a man-made island. I have not, but I've heard that there's that the piers in, in that somewhere. Sure. I. I remember when we were talking in the early days of planning for the centennial, we were trying to come up with the, uh, what the theme of the centennial would be. And one of our board members said, um, 100 years in the past, 100 years in the future. And that, that's the one that we ended up sticking with. But, but she continued with that. She said, and for the 100 years in the future part, we can have it 30 feet underwater because of global warming. <laughs> Sure. They say that the places that hadn't been on the pier before, those are the stories that I used to get as a bartender. And I've included uh, in the book, in the back of the book, there, there's a section called Pier Icons. <clears throat> and a lot of these are the places that I heard so much about. I was lucky enough to work in one of them for, for several years before it disappeared too. The boathouse was considered the last of its kind, which is a real dive out on the pier. And uh, it, I think that, that that's part of what helped build the character. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Some of the other places, um, prior to the boathouse, probably the most popular restaurant on the pier was called Moby's Dock. <coughs> and um, Moby's Dock was out uh, just past where the ballroom was, if you can picture where the ballroom was. Or if you know the pier today, it was out just beyond where the bumper cars are. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, it was a it was a very popular place. Really, a drink most primarily a drinking establishment. Um, it was you know the local trouble that you that you get with the with the term dive. You know the the visual image that you get. But it was where all the characters would hang out. Um, Santa Monica Seafood is right across the pier from that. The original Santa Monica Seafood um, seafood distributors before moving inland in 1969. Uh, they had been on the pier for about 40 years. Um, there was Al's Kitchen, which I meant. Did I mention Al's Kitchen? Al's Kitchen was where the, the Save the Pier movement, that's where one of the groups met. Al's Kitchen was uh, where a lot of activists would hang out. Jane Fonda and, and uh, Tom Hayden, one of their favorite places. Joan Baez, too. That was really the, the activist artist hangout for a lot of years. Um, out at the end, there was the, the Porthole Cafe, which was open all night and uh, really primarily to serve the fishermen who would fish overnight. They were supposed to have excellent coffee. There was uh, where, where Rusty Surf Ranch is today was, was called uh, Fish and Chips. And they were, they were very well known for their homemade potato chips, which you could smell across the entire pier. And people still today, you know, when they come to the pier, they, 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 they say this place used to smell like homemade potato chips. You know, things that we would love to see come back. Um, before the boathouse was the boathouse, it was for 30 years. It was O.J. Bennett's Seafood Grotto. Originally, it was a place where uh, they had a, an outdoor patio that, that uh, overlooked the ocean, and, uh, and they had card games going out on the patio. 
there was um, there were and, and the pier has a history of, uh, of of gambling going on on the pier and off of the pier. There was a I, I detail in the book uh, a story of uh, a man who was caught playing craps with loaded dice and was thrown off of the side of the pier. Um, um, even more notorious than that, of course, was the gambling ships. There were gambling ships out in the bay that uh, water taxis would take you from the pier to the to these ships to, to gamble, and they were just beyond the three mile limit until um, Earl Warren uh, stepped in. Um, State Attorney Earl Warren stepped in and, and declared the limit to be three miles beyond uh, an imaginary point between making it far too out far too out of the way to get any any uh, water taxis to and back in, in the retail around the town. Lots of really rich stories that, uh, and I, I could go on. Yes. The police station was added in, uh, it opened in 1995, just before Pacific Park. And it was added for the specific reason that they were building an amusement park on the pier. Uh, when I started at the pier, the pier, uh, it was not the popular place it is today. There was an, uh, it was really uh, considered seedy and, and not a not a good place to visit, and certainly not a good place to go at night. There was a homeless encampment along the north side. There were there was always gang activity. I remember my first Saturday night, I saw a, a gang incident, and that was my introduction to Saturday night in Los Angeles. And I'm, I'm a small town kid from Colorado, and uh, so when they decided that they were going to build an amusement park on the pier, they did not want that to be attractive to to that element. They wanted to do something about that element first, and they put the police station on the pier for that purpose. Good. Fall or jump? Yeah. He asked how many how many times or how often people fall off of the pier by accident. I don't recall anything in the last. Uh, it's been. I don't recall any real accidents. There's been people that have been pushed. There have been people who uh, may not have really realized where they were and fell by accident, but they've been more considered jumpers. Um, it is illegal to jump off the pier, but that's just like being illegal to commit suicide. It's really only illegal if you get caught. <laughs> Um, and people do get caught. I've, uh, and I've jumped off the pier. I've jumped off of the pier under the supervision of the harbor patrol. And it is a long way down. Um, you know, about halfway down, you're, you're thinking, I should have hit the water by now. Um, and then you end up underwater for a long time. And the most dangerous part, though, and the harbor patrol will tell you this, they're not so worried about the fall. It's when you try to, try to rescue yourself and grab onto one of the pilings because of all the barnacles on the pilings cutting people up. That's the most dangerous part of falling off the end of the pier. Swim, yeah, swim to the beach. Yeah. Sure did. I have a huge photo library, and I have um, I have photos that you can find in other people's collections that uh, I cannot give you to use, but I can send you to the people who have them and seek their permission. But I, I have those. I have I have those actual posters in my office. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we'll definitely talk, and I, I want to see the the Santa Monica Pier room definitely. Good. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Thank you.